Finland and also Professor Stotayada from University of Glasgow. And uh, we, I'm just saying to, to like to say that you have like two classes here, one on research methods and one on water resource management. They are very keen to learn from you. Yeah. Okay. Very Yours good. Yours, fellows. Okay. Thank you very much, Stefanos. Uh, it is our pleasure to be here in Nazarbayev of uh, University Graduate School uh, Public Policy Conference. And uh, uh, today we are going to talk on a water issue. And the title of session is Water Desiccation and Water uh, Decline in Eurasia, as you see here. As you know, the water and related issue is very important all over the world. Water is a single resource without any substitute. It is limited resource and it's very scarce in some country across the world. But it has a social, economic, and environmental value. Poor water management and water shortage can lead to diseases, malnutrition, reduce economic growth, and many other problems across the world. Nowadays, water is one of the most critical breakdown of peace between the country and the nation. We have a lot of conflict across the world, like uh, uh, over the Nile River between Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan, or uh, over the Tigris and Euphrates between Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. And we have also problem in Jordan River between Palestine, Israel, and Jordan. So we have um, all the time, we have a river regulation in upstream, and we have a problem in downstream. And we should take care about that. A river and water in uh, or Eurasia, that is the title of this session also, play a significant role in uh, political equation there. And we have a lot of common water resources in Eurasia, like Caspian Sea, like uh, Tigris and Euphrates. We have Aral Sea, Amu Darya, Sir Darya. They are a common water resource between the nation. And there is a lot of transboundary issue between these countries. So it makes more important or more important issue in the water things. And many rivers are, form the border between the country and it is the source of conflict in terms of politic issue. So uh, today we have a six presentation. First of all, I would like to ask San, a PhD candidate from University of Olu, to talk about upstream development and downstream tra tragedy. He mainly talk about Tigris and Euphrates fraud, uh, Tigris and Euphrates in Middle East. So I stop sharing and ask, ask Sahan to share his um, uh, uh, presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Trabi. Uh, first of all, I would love to say hi to everybody in this session. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, let me first share my screen. Okay. Well, uh, you, have, you have a 10 minute to talk, then we have okay, opportunity okay. to have five Can you see my screen? Sure, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the topic that I'm gonna uh, talk about is uh, about the impact of uh, river regulation uh, in upper streams uh, on uh, downstream regions. So based on that, our work is titled Upstream Development, Downstream Tragedy, Flow Regime Alteration over the Tigris and uh, Euphrates, as you can see the, that we are going to talk about uh, the, uh, this region. And this work has been done with Dr. Trabi and Dr. Klo. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, first of all, I will, I will give you a story of the area in terms of the transboundary rivers, uh, the development and tragedy that had happened uh, since before in this region. Um, a short description of the methods will be given, the river regime alteration, study area, and also the uh, river impact on the downstreams uh, will be presented to you. So starting with the introduction, as you know, the transboundary rivers encompass roughly 80% of the global river flow and uh, run through basins governed by multiple territories, uh, governments, and countries with conflicting interests. Most of the transboundary rivers endure major hydropolitical issues dealing with different watershed management practices and uh, numerous contradictory development plans, which have caused um, severe uh, regime change in several large river systems. 
So uh, headwater regulation uh, has affected ecosystems, navigation, fisheries, and agriculture in many river basins, such as uh, the Zambezi in Africa, Mekong in South Asia, and also Indus in uh, almost Eastern parts of Middle East, uh, between Pakistan, India, uh, and uh, China. So what we have here is, uh, uh, I mean, our case, we are, we are going to talk about the Tigris, Euphrates, and Arvandrut case. So these uh, uh, rivers are located in the Mesopotamia, uh, uh, region, which is a historical region of Western Asia, and uh, is the site of the earliest developments of agriculture and settlements from around 10,000 years ago because of the semi-arid climate on one hand and uh, the presence of these two rivers, I mean the Tigris and Euphrates, on the other hand, this region was made a humid, fertile and ideal for uh, human beings to start settlements. That's the reason why earliest civilization like Ashuria, Akkad, Sumer, and uh, Babylonia, and earliest empires like uh, Achaemenid Empire emerged in this region. So, uh, but and here you can see, for example, a uh, uh, first a, a picture of first settlements uh, of this region. But thousands of years later. I mean, after that uh, settlement, uh, during the past century, the riparian countries started to develop uh, different types of hydro systems for different purposes, mostly for hydropower and agriculture to sustain their energy and food security. On the other hand, land use and land cover change as a result of other anthropogenic activities has changed a lot during the past decades. All in all, uh, these regulations on the rivers and changes in lands uh, have had many consequences uh, for, you know, in the downstream areas uh, and Arvand route as our target we are talking about, such as saltwater intrusion, uh, abundant farmlands, very uh, intensive problems in fish stock and fishery, endangering biodiversity, uh, navigation problems, and also uh, the dust storms. Uh, as I mentioned before, our case is Arvandrut, which is also called in Arabic Shatul Arab. Uh, Arvandrut is a transboundary river in the Middle East, uh, draining water from Turkey, Iraq, Syria, Iran, Jordan, and uh, Saudi Arabia to Persian Gulf, which is formed by the confluence of uh, Tigris and Euphrates near the city of Urdana in Iraq, about almost 110 kilometers in the northwest of Abadan in Iran. This river drains to the Persian Gulf after passing the port of Basra in Iraq, joining Karun River and the other cities nearby. And the width of Arvandrut River before swimming into Persian Gulf varies between uh, 200 to 2,500 uh, meters and in depths of 9 meter to 15 meter, which makes it navigable. This river, river supports the marine habitats in north western coastal parts of the Persian Gulf and the uh, Mesopotamian marshes. And as you can see, the uh, two main tributaries of this uh, river here, uh, Tigris and Euphrates are the main tributaries of uh, Arvandrut. Well, construction of more than 140 dams in the Tigris and Euphrates basin has caused significant flow alteration and uh, that's remained less water for meeting the water demands of downstream and aquatic ecosystem, including the coastal zone, estuaries, and wetlands. And you can see how the reservoir capacity uh, in different stages of time and decades has increased uh, dramatically uh, for all the countries, almost all the countries, mostly for uh, the Turkey. And uh, this has caused many uh, river flow art alteration and regime change. As you can see, um, the black line 
uh, is uh, regarding the pre-impact. And these graphs are the monthly uh, flow regime uh, for the period of, uh, actually the pre-impact is for the period of 1911 to 1940. And the post-impacts based on these stages uh, are from 1940 to 1955, 1960 to 1970, 1975 to 1984, and 1990 to 2005. As you can see, um, for these three stations, Antigris, Euphrates, uh, Euphrates and uh, the confluence of them in Arvand's route, uh, you can see the significant conversion from clearly seasonal, as you can see, uh, it's monthly, a clearly seasonal pattern to very uniform pattern during the year. And uh, that might be the reason of uh, hydro system development in upper streams. So the question that emerges here is how to quantify these impacts. So um, uh, for evaluating the, the impacts uh, uh, based on the, <coughs> sorry, based on the river regime characteristics in terms of timing magnitude at variability, uh, three factors were combined and developed an uh, impact factor um, uh, to quantify these change between uh, pre-impact and post-impact. And uh, these uh, river regime impact factor is uh, categorized into five uh, categories, uh, varies between zero and one. Zero means uh, very uh, affected and uh, one means uh, no alteration. So here, as a result, uh, in Kuta station at Tikris, you can see that in different stages of time, how the uh, river impact changed uh, from low to moderate, to severe and to drastic uh, from 1940 to 1955 stage to uh, 1990 to 2005. And as you can see, uh, these changes from these stages uh, were mostly uh, because of the magnitude and MIF as a uh, representative of magnitude. So uh, the amount of water has decreased mostly. And by the pass of time, uh, variability and timing also included. Another example uh, is uh, the Hindia station on Euphrates, uh, which has changed from uh, incipient to uh, moderate, drastic, moderate, severe, and drastic, uh, but mostly in uh, variability and timing. As a conclusion, uh, river has, uh, as you saw before, river regime has altered in both uh, Tigris and Euphrates and in Arvand route uh, as a consequence and uh, their confluence. River impact in Tigris has changed from low to drastic, mainly in terms of magnitude. Uh, river impact in uh, Euphrates has changed from low to drastic, mainly in terms of timing and variability. And in, and, and in the Arvand route from low to drastic for all the three factors. The, the hydro system development in upper stream has had uh, many, many uh, negative consequences consequences on in terms of economy, biodiversity, ecosystem, and navigations are Arvand route. And many hydropolitical and water conflicts between riparian countries have uh, emerged uh, during these uh, decades and uh, placed the downstream, I mean Arvand route, in a mercy position for minimum environmental uh, flow. Also, there is another dam in, uh, under construction called Ilsu Dam in Turkey. And uh, the question is, what will happen if it starts being operated with the current situation? Uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Thanks for your time. And uh, uh, I, I'm open if you have any question I can answer to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sahan. It was Thank interesting. You and you talk on time. 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And then yeah. it's good that we, we have opportunity to have one or two questions. If somebody asks, have any question, please. Yes, yes Dr. Ali, I have a question for Sahan. Yeah. Uh, what one question, Sahan, you were mentioning, well, I have personal and professional interest in this, this part of the world because I worked there for several years. It was in, in Turkey, in the Gap region. 
when the, the during the first years of development. Yeah. And you mentioned, I mean, you're absolutely right that with dam development, the flow is affected and we did the activities uh, downstream. But you mentioned that there are socioeconomic, there have been socioeconomic impacts downstream, but that has also been because of the poor management of the water resources in the countries. Not everything has been because of the dams built upstream. And I think that it's important to make a distinction with that. And my second question is, would you know what is the annual flow? Because the last data I had was that only in the Euphrates, with which I'm more familiar, the annual flow after dam construction was 25 billion cubic meters, which is a very large amount of water. But yeah. what is the, the flow now and how much is going to, to Syria? How much is going to Syria from Turkey? Yes. Uh, well, uh, at this time, I, uh, you know, I don't have the exact number on my mind, but maybe Dr. Turabi can help me uh, regarding that part because it's uh, you're talking about a very special part of this uh, basin. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Turabi, do you have any idea about uh, the amount mm -hmm. that has changed from? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, um, unfortunately, there is not clear data. Uh, from from Turkey side, we have okay. even got got all data from the Turkey except the border data for mm -hmm. transfer water from the Turkey to uh, Syria, and uh, unfortunately we don't have that one. And mainly in this work, we uh, work deal with the, the data that's available in this uh, two station in Iraq at the low end point mm -hmm. of the basin. Thank you very much. Yeah, and mainly such kinds of data are, uh, you know, considered uh, strategic and they are not openly ex accessed. And uh, yeah. yeah, reaching to them is a bit problematic, I think. Th that, that is true, Sahan. But my point in all this, and I would like to thank you again for your presentation, is that one has to make a very clear distinction between dam construction and the impact downstream. Because many of the ones you mentioned are not because of dam construction. And yeah. So They're not we, because of the yeah. dam construction, sorry for interrupt, right. but uh, uh, maybe these impacts and uh, change are because of land use, land cover change or other <laughs> things right. that they are, uh, on the other hand, maybe they are, uh, you know, somehow related to those dams that have been constructed because, you know, the purpose of uh, constructing the dam are, uh, you know, somehow related to those to those cha other changes uh, in general. But there are lots of uh, other things, other uh, reasons, uh, political interests, and uh, many other things. But thanks for mentioning this point. And uh, I think it's, uh, it, sh it should be clear that uh, these parts should be uh, you know, uh, splitted and distinguished. Thank you, Sam. You're welcome. Hey. Thank you very much, Sahan and Cecilia, for a nice question. Uh, please uh, stop sharing, Sahan, uh, and we ask sure, uh, Cecilia to uh, share her presentation. Dr. Cecilia from the University of Glasgow. Glasgow, the floor is yours. Some, yeah, uh, I think I stopped. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I can you see my screen because I cannot uh, see. It's not yet. No. All right. And I'm supposed to be a screen share. So let's see. You cannot see it, right? So Not I think yet. no. And I am sharing, so I have no idea what is going wrong. But uh, but uh, maybe waiting a little because it's mentioned that Cecilia has loading. started. Yes, yeah, loading. it's loading. Yeah, oh, wait. Thank you. thank you so much. So while it loads, and in the interest of time for the rest of the presentation, uh, I, I will be, well, thank you very much to Professor Stefano Sanarius for the invitation. And again, Ali, very good to meet you. Yeah, uh, nice to meet you. Thank you. My presentation is going to be, but on the not on on droughts, but it's going to be in, on floods. And if you ever see my screen, please let me know. Otherwise, yeah, not yet. Okay. 
so I will uh, I will start explaining what this is about so that I don't delay the other presentations. But my presentation is going to be on work I have been doing, in this case, not droughts, but it's been on urban flood management in tropical regions. And this is in specifically in the case of Singapore, where I was, well, where I was working for about a decade and I'm still involved. And this is, there have been floods throughout the history of Singapore as has happened in many other places. But the, there were two floods a decade ago in 2010 and 2011, where uh, there were many impacts because the floods were in a very urbanized area and an area that is considered very important as a, as a touristic area. So there have been investments in the billions of, of dollars and there were three flash floods in 2010 and 2011. In some cases, there were more than 100 millimeters in millimeters. I'm sorry, in half an hour, in one hour, another 153 in half an hour. So there was a complete, a very comprehensive policy response uh, that was divided into three parts. One of them was that. Uh, an expert panel was put together to understand the reasons for the, the floods and also the impacts. And second, an opportunity was taken to develop the potential of digital infrastructure, green infrastructure, and of course, the traditional infrastructure, which is the, the built infrastructure, and also to build new capability. And the third strategy was to improve public understanding of flood events. And what came out of the, of the expert panel on, it was called expert panel on drainage design and flood protection measures, was that the number and intensity of, of not extreme events yet, but of rainfall that exceeded 70 millimeters per hour that was, had been increasing. And these records are from 1980 to 2000. And, and 10. So if you're in an environment where your events, uh, are, your rainfall is increasing, then you have to plan for it not only in terms of drainage, but in terms of, uh, you require a more comprehensive response. And in terms of infrastructure, the construction code was changed because it's not the change of one infrastructure at some point, but the, cons the, the regulations. And it was a construction C code. C C Cecilia, it, yes. it seems we, we couldn't see your presentation at all. Uh, okay. I just ask if the organizer has your presentation, they share it. If no, they have, uh, you didn't send it before. Okay. No, Cecilia, no, if you can upload it, if you can send it, if you can send it the chat, we can upload it from there even. Okay. Would you like if, to go to, to the next presentation while I send? Uh, yes, yes, we can start with the next one. Or then then you can uh, send to, to from my side. Yeah, okay. very good. Okay, because it would be good that we see the presentation and you talk. Okay, let's go to the next one. If uh, Nizar is ready to present, Nizar uh, Abu Zakis from University of uh, Oulu. He is a postdoc researcher here and he wants to talk about a, a journey from <coughs> meteorological to agriculture drought in arid and semi-arid region. Uh, Nizar, please if you're ready, share yeah, your... Uh, I'm ready. Uh, so can everyone hear me first? First hello for everyone. Yes, we hear you very well. We have a lot of participants and a special hello to Dr. Stefanos, uh, my co-author in one of my papers. Haven't seen I'm, yeah, so I will also try to share my screen because my laptop sometimes isn't that reliable in big moments. <laughs> Let's see if it's if it is okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, <laughs> okay. So, uh, can you see my? Uh, yes, can we can see. see. But okay, it is not in the presentation mode, it is just in the uh, PowerPoint mode, it's okay. Uh, no, but uh, no, so then I have to share another screen. <laughs> yes. Yeah, one second.
So now you cannot see my screen, right? No, we see just the PowerPoint in the PowerPoint mode, not presentation mode. Just put is, it, in. is it better now or no? Oh, yeah. we, we, we can't see it, but it is just in the PowerPoint mode, not presentation. Yeah, I understand. Um, now we can see only your screen that with your note. Okay, then I will I will just uh, make the presentation in the usual mode because okay. for some reason it's not working. Just anyway, so, yeah. So, uh, uh, so my presentation is, uh, is talking about the journey from uh, meteorological to agricultural drought. So in this presentation, we talk about how uh, human, uh, how the over exploitation of water resources and human interference affect the affect the, the occurrence of the droughts in the area so uh, if uh, for some reason you cannot see my slides or just let me know because i can see it in the full mood now but anyway so a uh, very uh, quick introduction for arid and semi-arid zones as you can see uh, in the uh, in the yellow color it's the semi-arid zones and in the orange color it's the, uh, it's the arid zones uh, Semi-arid zones are considered to be zones with precipitation less than 400 millimeters, while uh, the arid zones are supposed to be uh, with less than 100 millimeter. So uh, arid zones are very important uh, and semi-arid zones in the world because they cover like 30% of the world uh, area and 20% uh, of the population live there. Uh, I will go quickly because I want to talk more about the results. Uh, since also this uh, conference is about Croatia, uh, uh, semi and uh, arid zones, uh, semi arid zones are also a very big part of Croatia, with 40% covering Croatia and 35% of the people living there. So, as a quick uh, as a quick um, introduction to drought, there are actually four kinds of drought: meteorological drought, which is when you have a precipitation, low uh, precipitation. Hydrological drought, when you have a low stream uh, flow. Agricultural drought, uh, which is uh, related to the effects of uh, 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 effects of the droughts by decreasing the agricultural area. And socioeconomic droughts, which are related to the effects of uh, these uh, droughts on the socioeconomy. So, um, in, uh, in when making a water management system, uh, the most important thing is to see the balance between the needs and the renewable uh, energy uh, sources uh, or uh, water sources so uh, if the demand is higher than um, uh, that then the renewability rate <clears throat> then there's a drop so for each country we should actually check uh, the renewability rate and the amount of water needed so that there will be a sustainable uh, usage of these resources Okay, so our study area is in uh, Fars, <coughs> uh, Bahtagan, and Zandirud uh, catchment. Uh, this uh, area is located in central and uh, southern Iran. You can see in the green color here is, is Gafuni, uh, blue is Fars, and Bahtagan is uh, red uh, in red. Okay, so this uh, study uh, has two objectives actually. First of all, to link between uh, the ag agricultural expansion and the droughts occurrence. And uh, the second uh, one, to see if there is a human impact uh, increases the drought occurrence frequencies. Anyway, so uh, since uh, we have the methodology class here, so this is a good idea about uh, the methodology we are using and the research framework. So in assessing, uh, in assessing the impacts of agriculture on this area, first of all, we use the Amberger classification to see if there is any change in the, in the precipitation level uh, to check if there is any meteorological droughts. Then we check the SPI for these areas to see if the precipitation level volume, sorry, has changed. Then we use the SDI, which is a stream drought index, to check if there is any change in, uh, in the flow between the upstream and the downstream. Uh, GRACE data was used here to check uh, the groundwater uh, depletion and the WI to, change, uh, to check if there's any changes in the uh, to check if there's any changes in the uh, in the water bodies area 
And we made two, uh, two drought indices actually to check uh, if, uh, how is the agricultural area changing over time. Okay, so uh, with the results, uh, we have checked that for Fars province, for example, uh, the, uh, the type of climate has decreased in the, uh, first of all, our studies for 40 years from the 1970s until 2020. So in this, uh, in this time frame, we have checked that uh, climate variability has decreased uh, from 21 type of uh, climate to 14. Uh, we uh, didn't have any, uh, any change in the precipitation volume. Uh, so uh, the meteorological droughts were occurring randomly. But uh, after 1997, we could see that there is a significant negative trend in the flow of, uh, of the rivers. Uh, irrig so irrigated areas here increased until uh, 2006, but then uh, they started decreasing after that because of the depletion of, uh, of the water resources. Uh, groundwater, there was 10 meter depletion 20 years, and in grace also uh, showed the same, uh, the same result. Uh, and the inflow decreased by 60%. So here, uh, it's, I will just remove this picture because it was supposed to work better than this. So here you can see the Bechtagen Lake uh, in 1997 and in 2004, uh, it, they were full with water. And then in 2010 and 2014, you can see that they totally dried out. And this picture, which is supposed to work better than this, if this slide was working, you can see the Bechtagen Lake, it's totally, uh, totally dry and uh, it's affecting the ecosystem and uh, all uh, the biodiversity of the area. The same, I would say, uh, for uh, Gaf, uh, for Zandiru, sorry, sorry, that is in central Iran. Uh, since it's in central uh, Iran, uh, there was no climatic uh, change. Uh, the irrigated areas doubled in 40 years, so which led to, uh, to a depletion in groundwater. Uh, and in the surface water, 60% uh, of the years we had this hydrological depletion, while uh, in the same time, 90% of the years uh, were considered to be normal or wet. So what we are trying to say here that uh, droughts were not occurring, but there were hydrological droughts uh, based on doubling the farm area. Same here, I will just remove this. So you can see here the Gafkuni Lake, which is in the end, uh, of uh, the Andy Root River, you can see in the beginning, in the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, it was full of water, but uh, 10 years ago, it was totally dry. And here you can see the Zandi Root uh, River, uh, which, is, which was totally dry. And uh, this picture was in 2016. So uh, here is like an overview of what you wanted to say. This is for Fars. You can see this, uh, this uh, here shows uh, the amount of precipitation and you can see the normal years are the major of the years which are in green. The wet years are minority and uh, the dry years are minority. But you can see that uh, in all the station, hydrological stations that we, we had, you can see there's a negative trend in all the years from 1990s, uh, 1977 to 2016, there's a negative trend always. And, especially after the year 1996, you can see that there is a big decrease in the flow uh, of, uh, of the rivers. Same for Gafkuni. Uh, uh, here you can uh, see that uh, for SPI, the normal years are, uh, are, are the most dominant. Drought years are uh, very, uh, very low and wet years also. But you can see uh, the, the drought here, of the hydrological drought, the stream flow drought, you can see it's it's uh, it's the dominant, and uh, with the years you can see that uh, the SPI minus the SDI, which shows the occurrence of this hydrological drop, it's like going below the zero. And here it is like the final uh, final conclusion of of our result. This uh, graph shows the um, the total farm area. So here you can see the irrigated area the rain fed area and the total farm area. So you can see that the irrigated area had a definite and big increase until the year 2006. And then you can see that there is a, there is a decrease in those irrigated areas because of the water depletion. Uh, rain fed areas kept on de decreasing because people were using that irrigated farming since it's more prosperous. 
And here we have the overall uh, overall um, agricultural area was, as I said before, was a positive trend until 2016 and then a great division. So as a general conclusion for this, uh, for, for this study that we were having that human effects and the over-exploitation of uh, both uh, surface and uh, groundwater is leading for the droughts with the big socioeconomic effects of these droughts. And uh, as, as we saw, because the precipitation volume was normal and the average was okay for that year. So that's all that I'm going to say. And I'm very sorry for the screen not working, but hopefully we could, uh, you could see what I'm talking about. Okay. Thank you. It, it, th thank you very much, Nizar. It was interesting and we, we see it. Okay, good. So, good. <laughs> yeah. So good. Uh, is there any question? We have a time for one or two questions from Nizar. If somebody has a question, please uh, raise hand and start to talk. It's floors for question. Can I can I ask another question? No, yes, Nisa. please, please, Thank please. You. Thank you, Nisa. What are the limitations of gra of using grace? Uh, well, first of all, uh, grace, um, uh, uh, good question. First of all, grace should, if it is used, it should be used for uh, basins uh, which are bigger than 200,000 kilometers, okay? So our, our basins that we were using had a, had a smaller area than that area. So uh, in one of the papers that uh, we were, uh, that we wrote about this grace data, uh, we showed that uh, if there is any, uh, if there is any error uh, regarding, uh, or how much the error is regarding using of the GRACE data. So uh, since we had insight to that, uh, insight to data, the groundwater, and after removing uh, the soil moisture and the surface water and, um, uh, and the evapotranspiration and comparing just, for example, the GRACE uh, water mass uh, data with the groundwater data, uh, we could see that uh, the error was around 15% between both data. So I would say that a number will be smaller uh, when dealing with bigger uh, vessels. But, but, but it still is valuable, right? It still is a, it's a good tool to use. Yes, yes, it's, it's a very good tool to use. And, uh, and since, but also we should know how GRACE works because GRACE shows the, the change in the total water mass in a, in a basin or in an area. Uh, so for me, yeah, that was the thing that I was doing through my PhD. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, a very good question and reply. Just for information, the GRACE is a satellite data that support the, uh, they use it for evaluate the fluctuation in the groundwater. Just to inform to PhD student in Nazarbayev University, this is GRACE. So uh, thank you very much. Cecilia, you, did you send your presentation to Estefanos? Ali, we have one question from Nuri. Yes, please. Let's see. Can check. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for presentation. I think it's a big problem over the world. And uh, I have uh, two questions. First of all, it's about uh, history of this problem. Uh, did you uh, research? Um, uh, uh, before 1997, what what was with this uh, water or uh, sea or, or other uh, uh, problems before 1997? And uh, nowadays we can uh, say that in future we uh, that water can be more expensive than diamond. So uh, in, uh, from a new revolution, agricultural revolution, when uh, uh, when uh, was lack of food, uh, we decided this problem. We substitute or made genetic modified for uh, then. So do we have any substitute? Because we know that air, food, and water is, uh, is uh, one of the important uh, for life and uh, do you have any issue or solution for this problem in history? Uh, not only from 1997, but before it and uh, that's all. Thank you. Okay, okay. Very, 
thank you for your question. Well, first of all, uh, before uh, first of all, before the 20th century, I would say we didn't really have much problem because the population was not uh, that high. I think at the beginning of the 19th century or the middle it was like 1 billion now we are like 7.9 billion and there in 2050 we might reach 10 billion 15 billion nobody knows so for your question about this area in before 1977 the area didn't have an expansion in the irrigated areas because this project started after the iranian revolution then uh, the iranian government uh, started to making dams and started to uh, provide water and I'm not Iranian myself, maybe Dr. Ali can tell us more about this, but the irrigation expansion happened after the, after the 70s. That's why we had, we started to have this problem of the depletion actually. But uh, regarding your question, uh, what can we do in the future? Of course, we cannot uh, use something else except water because we need water for agriculture. But uh, um, our suggestion, and that's what was something I was saying in my PhD, defense, that we need to increase the yield of, of farming. That would be one solution. Uh, and then knowing where to use water, like which which country, what does it need? For example, you might, in one country might be wheat is more important than potatoes, for example. So increasing the yield and uh, and uh, knowing where to use your water might be one solution. And that's what I was talking in the first slide about the water management system. For each country, it's different. So, for example, in Kazakhstan, the water management system or plan is different than what we use here in Finland, for example. Uh, so, I don't know how much I answered the question, but uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Nizar. I think uh, hopefully he got your message because we don't have time more. We can continue with the Cecilia presentation, please. Uh, Stefanos, I think if you can help for presentation. Yes, Cecilia, floor is yours. You can see the present my, my screen now, right? Yes, yes, perfect. So Cecilia, you can go ahead. When you tell me this next, I do. Yep. Mm. Uh, I'm the one. It... Yes. Uh, Stefano, I'm sorry. Just give me a second. I cannot see the presentation. So clearly the problem is is on my side. All right. So as I thank you. As I was saying before, my presentation today is in on floods. Uh, there are problems, and there are problems in, in Singapore. This is going to be with focus on Singapore. There are problems in terms of droughts, but I will focus on floods. And the re, as a result of the, the concerns that there could be, because this is a tropical area, that there could be uh, droughts is that the system has been established, a system has been set not only to store as much water as possible, but also to keep it clean, uh, to keep uh, the water clean and also to, con to produce water, which is recycled wastewater for non-potable and potable uses and also for, and also the desalination plants. So there are concerns for droughts, but in this case, I'm going to focus on, on floods. Uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. So I was mentioning I'm going to focus on Singapore. And if you can, well, this is in the tropics, in a subtropical area. And as you can see in the several figures, Singapore has uh, changed with time. And this has been because of land reclamation, about 30% of land has increased and every time there has been an increase has been for a specific purpose, which is for a specific land use. And we did more water has, as it happens, more water is needed and more electricity and more services. And it has become, it's, it's highly urbanized. So whatever flood you have is going to affect a large number of people. The next one, please. Thank you. So I'm going to, to focus this presentation on two uh, floods, flash floods that happened already a decade ago, but that were very important because policies were changed at that time. And the policies have continued changing, changing but based on, this, on these two floods. They were in 2010 and in 2021. And they happened in an area that is lowland, most of Singapore is lowland. And it is an area that is 
very important economically. And several billions of dollars have been invested there precisely for tourism. Uh, the next one, please. So there were the, the three flash floods and people were very concerned that the government may not be uh, making the, the, may not be taking the, the appropriate policies to avoid a next flood or impacts of the next flood. Because as we know, there is, we have learned there is no such thing as flood control. Now it is more management. And so three uh, strategies and responses were in three main forms. One was an exercise to understand what were the reasons and what were the impacts. And second, to harness the potential of infrastructure, built, green, and digital infrastructure, and build capabilities for each one of them. And then improve the public understanding of flood events. The next one, please. Thank you. So as part of this uh, exercise, to understand what were the reasons and what were the impacts of the flood. There was an expert panel, international expert panel on drainage design and flood protection, because the first idea was to focus on, on drainage. And later on, it, it, the policy became much broader. So it's not only about drainage, it is about the catchment management. And many, many recommendations came out of this expert panel that were implemented and that were, were first discussed and then implemented when appropriate. But basically what came out was that the number of, of hours of rainfall was more than 70 millimeters was in, had been increasing, which means this is until 2010 when the floods happened. And if we see the graphs at present, the, this trend continues being the same. But it has been increasing, so uh, rainfall is more and it's happening, it's more intense. The next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of infrastructure development, what happened was uh, first the protection of the area. It was the uh, diversion canals and the tension tanks are not uncommon. What was different in the case of Singapore was that the area is very urbanized and it no area was demolished. So the, the engineers just did the best they could and they did. They, they managed to construct all this infrastructure without affecting any existing infrastructure. So there is a diversion canal that takes the water of about one third of the catchment area to one of the river that discharges into a reservoir and then to the sea. And then the detention tank, which is the capacity is about 38,000 uh, cubic meters. This is, of course, much more small than the detention tank that exists in Tokyo. But let's see it in the context of the catchment. And in this case, this has been enough. It has not been used so far, but this is thinking towards the future. So this is something else that came out of this, this exercise of assessment. Let's plan in the long term because of, of all the changes, because of climate change. The next slide, please. Thank you. A uh, number of solutions were established. The construction code, as I have mentioned before, was changed. And one of the many examples on how it changed is that any industrial, commercial, institutional, or residential development greater than or equal to 0.2 hectares, they were required to control, they were required to have the tension tanks, basically. That was the the decision. It, before this time, it was 0.1 hectares, then it, it changed to 0.2. The catchment, the decision was to manage the, there are no catchments, the, Singapore is very small, well, yes, the, the, the catchment, not, not basins, but the catchment, to manage them more comprehensively. At the source, you have to, as it is done in many places where there are floods, where you, your rainfall is much, the, uh, the objective was to keep the or is, not was, is to keep the rainfall in the, in the source uh, with the help of the tension tanks, the, the green roofs, what is considered now as green infrastructure. Then what is called the pathway, which is basically your infrastructure, your rivers or your canals through which the water is going to flow, they have to be clean. 
and they were expanded as much as they could, considering that this is an urban area. And then finally, the receptor, that is where the water comes and where it can damage the infrastructure. And what happened here was that the, again, uh, decisions were taken that the, uh, here it is again, that the uh, constructions were going to build at a higher level. The next one, please. And then people were, uh, were arguing that, how, not arguing, but they were uh, saying that if it wouldn't be possible that there are no floods, let's avoid the floods because we are a developed country. And then the government of Singapore, PUB, the National Water Agency, struggled to, no, they didn't struggle, the people struggled to understand that it doesn't matter if you are developed or developing countries, you, the impacts of, there will be droughts and floods because this is something that is not under the control of the government, but the impacts are going to be different depending on how much you plan for them. An example they gave was, for example, the drains, because people said the way in which Singapore has become less flood prone has been because of drain construction. Can we focus on that? And the response of PUB, of the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources at that time, was that yes, we can, but look at the consequences in terms of land use. So we have drains, different types of drains, and we will have to build them bigger. This means that we will have, the land use will have to change. Basically, whatever development that is in the way of the drain will have to be demolished. And because this is not possible, let's think on different solutions. And the different solution comes back to the management, not only to the construction. The next slide, please. And so I already explained the numbers one and the two, and then the number three, which is improve communication with the, with the population. And there were many concerns because of the losses, commercial losses, due to the flash floods in Singapore, the, like in Tokyo, for example, the, the buildings have, you use the underground space, where you use the basement space for commercial activities in the case of commercial buildings. And there were losses in the millions of dollars. And also in the case of the, uh, that was a commercial ones, but also in the parking lots, there were many losses. So the government committed to, to, to change the policies to avoid this type of losses, explaining that the floods wouldn't be avoided, but the impacts would be reduced. And at the same time, that people would have to understand that floods, they are floods, they are meteorological events. And this has taken, the, the part of the education is what has taken more time because you are speaking, when we talk about people, actors, stakeholders, you multiply by millions of people and each one of us has different understanding and different interests. So, but what was important again, uh, regarding these two flood events was that the policies change, the conversation with the population change and rather than the government educating the population, there have been many actions that have uh, allowed people to understand that or realize that policies have changed. People are being less affected. And this year, for example, has been very, very wet. There have been many flash floods and there, has been, there have been many impacts, socioeconomic impacts, which is what people want. And with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Cecilia. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, so let's see if there is some question from the audience. If please start to talk if to have any question. Yes, there is one, it seems. Tell me, uh, Ali, I don't know, I raised my hand. But yes. I have to. <laughs> so, <laughs> Cecilia, uh, uh, great things. And I I'd like to ask you some practical thing that. Um, I have been visiting this, uh, I cannot even spell it uh, pro uh, properly, Bison and Mo Kion Park, AMK yes. Park. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. This blue green infrastructure that has been quite mm -hmm. famous in Singapore, first in the tropics that they have rehabilitated and instead of these canal drainage, they are having this like norm better absorption of the flood. My question is, okay, that was a really nice thing. How possible is to make 
such kind of things in Singapore, given the limited space. And also, it, it, it took quite some time and it, it is quite a very kind of delicate, like replication of ecosystem. I don't know how well that it can work out, but do you think you can have such things in, in, and like demolish the old traditional canals uh, of drainage? Yes, uh, Singapore, as you know, started trying to improve the, the drain capacity. That was what was the important. And also because this, the city state is at a certain level of development and people wanted places to look nicer. So let's do it. Uh, but this is also, this is not only Singapore, right? It's been also the, um, a topic on which Australia has been working with the water sensitive cities. So at the end it's try to manage the floods and, and what do we do with our landscape? And you are absolutely right in the case of Bishan Park, because I can't pronounce the rest, but in case of Bishan Park, it took years to build this wonderful area. And wonderful because it gives, it's an area for, you, you are in a place that is highly urbanized and where you have high density of population and people need a break. So you, you develop an area where people can go and walk and you, this area at the same time is going to be like your retention pond for whenever the, the, the rainfall is very high. But PUV has been very careful on this type of projects because potentially, potentially each one of the canals can be made an ABC project, right? An, an active, beautiful, conserved water project. But in reality, it's been very expensive. And you have the canal, so in theory, you can demolish the canal and make, the, make an ABC project so that it looks more natural but that requires more land. So that means that you are limited to certain options. And the new parts of Singapore, like the Pongo area, they have been able, PUV has been able to develop more green projects, but because there is land. But in another cases, like you, you have mentioned now, it's, it's, not going to be, it's not going to be easy. And a very important part that one tends to miss also in, in, in Europe, in US, on these discussions on the green infrastructure, you need an institution in charge and you are the water supply and wastewater infrastructure. This is the role of PUV and you are, and also flood, flood management. So you build these projects because all these projects are for flood control. They are not for beautification. These are for flood, no control management. But at some point you need another, uh, you need the collaboration of another institutions, of another agencies. And the other agencies, for each agency to collaborate, they need funding, they need people, they need to have a mandate. So the, the development at a larger scale of this type of projects, which are so attractive, and which have been beneficial to a certain degree, because also, okay, to a certain degree is limited also by institutional uh, constraints. But in the world, there is all these, uh, there are all these discussions about the nature-based solutions and the nature-based solutions are going to solve the world, the problems of the world, they are not. They have limitations because at the end they are infrastructure development and like all infrastructure development, they have limitations. So like in this case, in the case of Singapore, they, they have been affected to a certain point and PUV is increasing wherever it can be done where there is land. So at the end is, is land constraints. Thank you very much, Cecilia. It was very interesting reply too. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions. We should go to the next presenter. Okay. Uh, it's good that we just a little back to the from the modern area in Singapore to the border of Iran and Afghanistan, the Hamun Lake. We would uh, Mahdi Akbar will present some uh, the, the presentation regarding to this occasion of the Hamun Lake in the border of Iran and Afghanistan. Please, Mahdi. Yeah. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, thank you for this event. I'm going to share my screen. Most disabled participant screen sharing. That's why I get. Uh, Mari, Adil, can we can we make uh, Mari a um, host? Yep. Please. Uh, yeah. 
No, I think you're 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 now. Yeah. Okay. Great. Now you should see my screen in full. I mean, mode. Is it true? Yes. Please okay, continue. Great. Uh, what I am going to talk is about the education of a transboundary water body as a result of anthropogenic activity. Uh, the case of city is Hamel Lake uh, in the border of Iran and Afghanistan. Let me use a pointer option. Okay. This research is done in University of Olo, Water Energy and Environment Research Unit, HSEM Research Group. The paper is now available, I mean the preprint of the paper is available in this address in our archive and it's submitted to Journal of Great Lake Research, it is under review. Okay, uh, what, is, what is the main importance of Hamel Lake that uh, led us to initiate a research on this water body is that Hamel Lakes uh, are the largest water body in Iran Plateau. They have the area, the cumulative area of them is more than uh, 8,000 square kilometer. Also, these lakes are in the, I mean, in the location of border between Iran and Afghanistan. So it is a, in a transboundary region with, with lots of political, medical, and security conflicts. Uh, the desiccation of the lake and to unemployment, also the dust storms in Zobol near the lake and also surrounding uh, cities. There is an intense regulation in upper stream, uh, the, the main river flowing to home lake it is, is this lake. Its name is Hirmand or Helmand. As you can see, there are so many uh, dams on it. And therefore, there is a water treaty between Iran and Afghanistan shown here that guarantee about 800 million cubic meter annual inflow from Afghanistan to Iran. This uh, bilateral treaty between two countries are, is known as water protocol. And here you can see that the inflow of Hirman to Iran has, has decreased from 4 billion cubic meter to less than 2 billion cubic meter in recent years. Also, we have almost 2 billion cubic meter inflow to uh, Iran from, I mean, Hirman, the lakes as designated. So it seems that water protocol is not enough. Uh, Homo lakes are four lakes. Uh, it's a complex water body, three open lakes in north. And at the end, there is another closed lake here. This A is known as Hamun Pujak, this is Hamun Sabari, this is Hamun Hirman, and this is Gouda Zarre. You can see here the annual, I mean, the monthly area of these lakes from 1919 to 2020 by Landsat images. And as shown here, you can see that C and D are almost desiccated, especially D, I mean, uh, as the terminal water body. But uh, the, the A and B gets water, but they have changed to temporal water body. Uh, there is a reservoir in Iran, very immediate after the border, constructed by Iran government. There are four reservoirs, known as Chahnime. Uh, and you can see here the area of each Chahnime. Uh, here you can see a sudden drop in all area of all Chahnimez. This is because of a severe drought in the region, except this period, which is from 2000 to 2004. All over the operation year, the Chahnimez were full, almost full. And this is the Chahnime 4 here, the biggest one, which is constructed in 2010. Uh, so that's why you can see that the area started to increase after, afterward. The cumulative area of this Chahnime is 1.5 billion cubic meters. So uh, as you can, as I shown here in this slide, almost full, I mean, total inflow from Hirmand to Iran is, can, be, can be regulated and stored in these uh, reservoirs. Okay, uh, so far I think you have some hints why the lake are desiccating, but let's dive into it by a hydrological approach. Uh, here we show the, I mean, time series of uh, precipitation in Hirman, in Hirman, I mean, basin, and also inflow of Hirman to in the location of border. 
to, to show how Afghanistan has regulated this river. You can see here that from 1916 to 2016, where both data were available, uh, precipitation and inflow to Iran were almost fully, I mean, by, were correlated, the correlation, this is the SPI and SDI, Standard Precipitation Index and Standard Discharge Index, which captures the, I mean, hydrological, uh, hydrological and meteor meteorological drought as talked Nizar. So you can see that before 2004, by high precipitation, the blue graph, high inflow to Iran is expected. By after a year, which I can say it started in 2004, the water part, I mean, I mean, water management of Afghanistan has changed and you can see a big gap between inflow and uh, precipitation. Although we have a high precipitation here, inflow to Iran is very low. Uh, so it, this graph captures the water regulation by Afghanistan country. So what is this? Uh, amount of water, which is quite high, being used. Of course, agriculture as the main consumer of water is uh, responsible for that. Based on different scenarios, we, we try to capture the temporal special, I mean, variability of water consumption in, in uh, Helmand Basin. And as you can see in different sub basins, the water consumption increase has, has been shown here, but here, as which captures the whole, for whole of the basin, uh, almost the water consumption has been doubled in one scenario from 1.5 billion to over two, and in another scenario from 2.5 billion to over 7 billion. So, what I, it seems that uh, agricultural land is increasing in Afghanistan. What about Iran? What is happening in Iran side? We have shown that Afghanistan is increasing agricultural lands, so regulating water, but of course, as a developing country, they cannot regulate the whole water in upstream. And some is left for Iran in downstream. <clears throat> Here we've shown three pair years. Each pair are similar in terms of inf annual inflow, but the year are different. And the, the difference is that is after construction of Chahnime 4. For example, 2006 and 1992 has almost similar annual inflow, about 4 billion cubic meter. But after, in this, I mean, year 2006, shown by green, Chahnime is, I mean, constructed. So you can see here that after construction of Chahnime, despite the fact that we have similar inflow to the country, the area is much less than what was used to in, in before, and also in other years. So Iran is also worsening the situation by, by regulating the left inflow of human liver. And the conclusion I can say is that both countries are responsible for lake desiccation, therefore, update of bilateral treaty water protocol is a must in the region to, I mean, stop the unsustainable development trend started in 2005 in the region. And we can, we can say that Hamon lakes are another victims of uh, RLC syndrome in Orosia region. And that's all from my side, please, if you have any question. Okay, thank you very much, Mahdi, for a nice no. presentation. Uh, please, if you have any question, ask Mahdi directly. I'm sorry, Sinda, since there are no questions, can I yes, ask please. another question? I don't want please. to take somebody's time. I'm just waiting to see if somebody. No, 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 please, please, please. please. Thank you. Uh, Mahdi, thank you very much for such an uh, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. So what alternatives are there for the lake? In what term you mean? In, in general terms, you have made an excellent presentation of how, because of the regulation of the two countries, the mm. lake has been shrinking. So what alternatives are there? Is it that there is not enough water as a result of which the lake will end up drying up? Or uh, is yeah, it's it's the matter of I mean, as I 
mentioned in my conclusion, it's a, a matter of unsustainable development in the region. You know, both mm -hmm. countries, Afghanistan as an upstream country and Iran as a downstream, are kinda in a water rival, in a water regulation competition. So they are trying to uh, regulate as much as possible because they think that it will lead to economic prosperity, I mean, uh, solving unemployment by uh, providing farmlands for uh, agriculture, I mean, sector, but I don't know why they, they did not understand from RLC syndrome started mm -hmm. in past years and continued at least two lakes, two important lakes in Iran, Homan and Urmi are fully designated or almost designated which has uh, security, unemployment, and medical consequences. But I don't know when we want to learn. We need to think about sustainable development. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So yeah, let's go for the next presentation. It's again, Mahdi will talk about Caspian Sea now, so just a little far in the north from the Hamun. Let's go to the border of Russia and Azerbaijan. Let's go. Yeah. Also, thank you, Cecilia, for asking question. It's nice always to share. Let's go for another presentation. <laughs> Now, can you see my screen? Oh, not Mahdi. It is not in the presentation mode. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. I will change yeah. it to full screen. Yeah. Please, okay. please. Yes. Is it yes, okay good. now? Yeah. Yes, very good. So next topic is vulnerability of the Caspian Sea shoreline, shoreline to change in hydrology and climate. Hydrology, I mean change in inflow and climate, climatic drivers like precipitation of transpiration. Um, the, 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 the main difference between, I can say, this presentation and previous one is that uh, I can say Homo lakes are, the, the main driver of desiccation in, in Homo lake is human. But we cannot say by this certainty about Caspian Sea. I will, I will discuss in detail in coming slides. This uh, uh, research is available online in environmental research letter. Uh, and you can download it. Let me use a pointer. You can download it by this, I mean, link. Uh, and the, so wh why we, I mean, shed a light on Caspian Sea and why this case study is important. As, as everybody know, uh, this, this uh, sea or more technically, lake is the most, I mean, largest, is the largest uh, inland water body of the world. Uh, and sea water level SWL of this water body is changing 100 times faster in comparison to global sea level in last century, which has, of course, huge economic uh, and social impacts. Uh, also, Caspian Sea is a transboundary uh, water body. Uh, shared between Kazakhstan, Russia, Iran, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan, and all these countries has <clears throat> important gulfs, as as shown here. So, vulnerability of coastal area to sea water level change is important for at least one, two, three, four, five countries. Uh, may, important gulfs of all countries are labeled here. I will mention some of them here. For example, Delta. Koltuk in Kazakhstan uh, is a diverse mosaic landscape. Uh, it's a migration corridor from Siberia to Black Sea and Mediterranean. It includes one of the largest hydrocarbon resources in the world. Uh, so it is important from bi biodiversity and economic point of view. For another, I mean, Gulf here in my country, Miankale is biosphere is reservoir. It's the strange, I mean, phenomenon happened last year. More than 13,000 birds were, I mean, died in this region because of the uh, botulism toxin, uh, which was due to desiccation of the um, Gulf. Or Turkmenbashi, Gezelagaja State, Astarakhan Reservoir, all are important for their countries in terms of 
uh, by diversity and economic aspects. First of all, we uh, tried, we, we, I mean, modeled the SWL change, sea water level uh, change, using water balance of the Caspian Sea. We used evapotranspiration and precipitation from CFSR, which is a reanalysis global data set. And also we got data from uh, Volga River, the, the most important river flowing to Caspian Sea. Uh, based on literature and using some other data, we found that total inflow to Caspian Sea is possible to, to be reconstructed by using on, only Volga River inflow because it, it is responsible for over 80% of total inflow. So we guess total inflow to the Caspian Sea. Therefore, the uh, water simulation was probable. We did water simulation. And also here you can see that after 1915s, uh, dam construction in the region is increasing exponentially. And total, I mean, dam reservoir in Caspian Sea Basin is over two. 230 billion cubic meter, which is almost 75% of total inflow to the lake, which is high, I mean, anthropogenic strengths on regulation of water to the sea. We used data, we used satellite images from 1917s to present using Landsat, Landsat satellite, and we found the boundary of the lake in each year. The lowest sea water level in past 80 years happened in this year, 1979, and, uh, and also in, in 2000, uh, in 1999, the SW was in the highest situation, in, at least in past years. So uh, we have the minimum state and the maximum state. The area minimum state is, the, is shown here by red border and the maximum state is the blue one. So the subtraction of these two maps shows the vulnerable zone of the Caspian Sea in terms of stable fluctuation. And also here we've shown that how, how I mean, far coast can retreat in different, I mean, region, for example, retreatment in Koltuk, the most vulnerable region of the Caspian Sea can reach over 100, 150 kilometer, which is, I mean, very high. Uh, as another main point can be dry, can be mentioned by this figure is that all countries' main gulfs are vulnerable to sea level change because you can see that coast can retreat exactly in the location of coasts considerably, which affects the I mean all countries around Caspian Sea. Anyway. As shown here, Kazakhstan is the most vulnerable country because uh, vulnerable zone area of the Caspian Sea is 2,000, almost 25,000 20, square kilometer and 17,000 uh, square kilometer, over 70% of this is located in Kazakhstan. Then Russia, then Iran, Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan are in other ranks of vulnerability. Based on the, I mean, area of the sea in different years and sea water level, I mean, in, uh, we drive that sea water level can capture the area change by linear regression. So we developed it and we use this uh, regression to, and water balance to analyze the sensitivity of the level change to different water balance terms like total inflow of evapotranspiration and precipitation. Based on a mathematic, which I don't want to dive into, we found that um, the lake is more vulnerable to evapotranspiration and total inflow change rather than precipitation. And we showed that uh, the vulnerable zone of the sea corresponds to shallow gulf. As you can see here, this is the basimetry map of the lake and these regions which corresponds to vulnerable zone has depths less than three meters. Finally, based on an ideological concept, equilibrium level, which captures, which shows the final state based on current statistics, I mean, mean of precipitation of transpiration and inflow to the lakes, shows that if a long time 
these statistics are mean? What would be the final constant level? This is the definition of equilibrium level. We found that uh, in this period, which shown here by one, we, we developed, a, I mean, we used equilibrium concept and developed a heat map for the sea, which shows based on the co different combination of inflow and precipitation minus evapotranspiration, what would be the equilibrium level. We found that in this state here, which is the combination of uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, inflow and precipitation minus evapotranspiration, the inflow was supposed to be more, the, the equilibrium level was supposed to be more than minus 26. That's why the, I mean, trend is increasing because the, the level in the first of, in this year is minus 29. So it needs to increase to reach this equilibrium level. But here is the second state. You can see here that the, this period and this period are second and third state, which shows that if such, I mean, situation persists, I mean, if inflow is same as what is now, what is shown here and what is shown here, the inflow is going, the, the level of the sea is going to be less than, I mean, minus 29 as shown here, which shows current state of the sea is, is not good. It, it is not a good news for us and we should expect losing more and more sea level in the future unless inflow increase or precipitation and evapotranspiration, which are climatic drivers of change. Uh, personally, I can say that uh, Caspian Sea is being affected because of climatic drivers change more than anthropogenic, although, the, as I've shown, because of dam reservoir, we are able as a human to regulate 75% of the total inflow. More than 60% of the Caspian Sea shoreline is surrounded by arid climate. And so when developing countries, so water is a very important source for economic development. Uh, and we have a high regulation capacity in the region. Although Afghanistan has no control on river flow, but it's most vulnerable country and all countries are affected by sea level change. So, ha so having a, uh, so having a plan, a unified uh, plan by contribution of all countries is, is a must to have a sustainable development and sustainable water resource management in the Caspian Sea Basin. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank oh, you. Very good. Thank you very much, Mahdi. It was an interesting presentation. Oh, we have a chance to have a one or two question. We have time, please, if you have any question. Yes, there is one. Uh, okay, Ali, uh, just quick, very quick. Maria, yeah. thanks a lot. I've read also the paper. It's really nice. The only thing is that many people, you know, in Kazakhstan here, what they write in the news is that don't worry about Caspian because Caspian has this season of fluctuation. Every three, four years, it happens like that. It comes down and comes up. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what comes in the news here many times. And another thing is that they say, okay, with, uh, with Caspian also, uh, we have uh, some kind of... Uh, Although completed uh, the dams, dams are not, are not made anymore. It has been made the last one in 1970, and these are, these are all. So the water will recover uh, after a while. And if it will not recover, it's not our fault, but it's the climate change, because there's going to be more evaporation. So we cannot do anything. So what's, what's the recent outcome out of this? I think this figure can explain uh, exactly, you know, what, what news is saying in your country is is true but not whole i mean truth you know <laughs> you can see here that is true the dam construction has been i mean has reached uh, its capacity maximum in 97 1918s and it doesn't develop anymore at least in russia as a main country and here shows the current statistics on P minus E as a climatic driver and inflow as a which 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 is also climatic, but the dam regulation is important in this driver as well. Current statistic of the P minus E is not in a good state. It's even worse than back then before 1917s, when, when the lake level reached the lowest in past century. So there is no good news from climatic driver. 
at least we should try to, I mean, mitigate this negative effect of climate by uh, inflow regulation, maybe less inflow regulation in upstream. Uh, but it's not happening as well, because as you can see, the statistics on inflow is also in worse situation in back, I mean, 100 years. So the combination of anthropogenic activities and climate is not a good news for Caspian Sea. Besides, based on climate change scenarios, a huge increase in evapotranspiration is expected in the region, which shows itself by minus, by negative, I mean, sign in the water balance regulation. So again, another bad news for Caspian Sea. Yeah, that's where our research has stopped, but maybe defining the reasons behind why inflow is decreasing is very important and maybe not easy because we are facing a very, very big, I mean, basin and developing land use, maybe development land use map is very hard task there. <laughs> maybe that's why we escaped. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, hey, very, very good, Mahdi. But I think in uh, Caspian Sea, the Russia is main uh, country that can uh, regulate the river because the main re uh, part of flow comes from the Volga, and the other country almost less than twenty percent water come from the other country. And uh, the, yes, climate change can be the main contribution for our other country to the Caspian Sea. So, yeah. uh, is there any other question, please, if I think Nurim has a question. Yeah, please, go ahead. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you for presentation. It, it was very good. And uh, I think uh, this question for all of professors. And uh, what do you think that critical points when countries start uh, to collaborate with each other to solve this problem? Or, or what uh, indicators can influence in, uh, to collaborate? to solve this problem? Well, uh, I think having common interest and common treat is the main, I mean, platform to having a unified and uh, bilateral, I can say, uh, water resource management in the basin. Because if, if something happened, everybody would be suffered. Uh, and as I showed here, all countries, Gulf is affected by seawater level change. It's not just the, mat, the, the, the problem of Kazakhstan. It's the problem of Miankaj in Iran also. There are thousands of kilometers <clears throat> far from each other. I think that's the main platform for collaboration. Okay. okay thank, thank you, Mahdi. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So thank you, everybody, for asking questions and listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Very good, very good uh, presentation. I like it. So now, by to, by now, we just talk about the problem, about what's happened, and now we will a little reply the question what we can do. Next presentation is talk about the design effective environmental flow release to maintain lake in region with intensive irrigation demand, and Aziza should be the next presenter for this. Uh, session. Please, Aziza, share your, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ali. Yeah, I think we reached the point when we need to answer the question that wisely uh, Cecilia raised. How can we actually solve this issue, yes, with these lakes? We saw so many uh, examples of desiccating lakes. But first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate Stefanos and also appreciate his work in bridging the gap between the scientists and policymakers. As, as um, this Leo School and the overall the conference is a policy, um, policy conference, but you always raise uh, the questions of sustainable development, of uh, sustainable use of natural resources, and it's really important uh, that um, the future policymakers are aware of those issues and about the uh, um, environmental problems in our region, particularly in Central Asia. And um, also, uh, as we saw, most of the cases are linked to the anthropogenic activities on, uh, on uh, um, 
effect of human development, uh, effect of economic activities in uh, the region, and how those, how our actions, how the policies taken in the past affects the nature and the biodiversity. So um, in this presentation, uh, we will um, show the results of uh, the work of several years of work conducted uh, uh, by Dr. Ali Torabi and Professor Bjornkov and our research group. Uh, so, as you saw uh, in previous presentation, we uh, studied uh, the influence of uh, uh, river engineering, uh, of damming, of uh, different uh, consequences of land change in the area, climate change, and uh, how those consequences affected the lake. Uh, conditions and uh, eventually we reached the point when we uh, collected all the knowledge about uh, the conditions of the lakes and what influence the conditions and then we can use all this knowledge to save uh, the issue and to save the lakes and solve the issue uh, I think Kazakh participants all know uh, the RLC case and uh, as um, you ask uh, when uh, these people will learn uh, from this uh, example, it seems that they won't, they don't learn. <laughs> this uh, cases uh, repeat and uh, the number of lakes that desiccate increasing every year you can see the image that we used to see about the RLC, it's quite common, but we can see the same pictures uh, of dry lakes in different regions. We know about the, uh, the Lake Chad in Africa, and these two examples are from Iran. Uh, this uh, Lake Urmia was uh, one of the largest saline lakes in Middle East, and uh, it varied, uh, the uh, lake surface varied around from 5,000 square kilometers to 6,000 square kilometers in the past, but now we're left with just 10% of it. And uh, the second largest lake is also decreased in size and we can see that it's all, almost disappeared. What, uh, what um, like management or which activities led to this catastrophe is mainly the damming, as uh, this region is arid region and this, uh, uh, the catchment is uh, highly uh, irrigated. So the main activity is agriculture in the region. And as we, you can see in the graph, the increase in damming Lead uh, to decrease in the, the water in the lake water level. So in this last period of our studies, it's the most recent period. We can see how the water lake water level has decreased and it also dropped below the minimum ecological water level in this lake. So. Uh, with increasing population and in increasing uh, water demand, um, the, the pressure on um, the region will increase, also as a climate change, uh, also adding to this issue. The damming and regulation of river causes uh, direct impact on the river system, and it also uh, affects the, the wetlands and the aquatic ecosystems, uh, but what we are going to look at this presentation is how it affects the terminal lakes in the systems. So maybe now we can erase, ask the question from your students, Stefans, and you can help me. How do you think, uh, what, what can be a solution for this? Okay, whoever would like to volunteer. <laughs> Any of you guys, are you still awake? <laughs> Okay, maybe I will answer this question and uh, for the next question. But acceptably, this will be ready. <laughs> yes. It's quite a difficult question. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to wake them up and they will be ready for the next question. 
So the answer is environmental flow, uh, which is a, a amount of uh, flow allocated um, to the um, reducing the impact of uh, damming and uh, um, uh, should uh, improve the ecological condition in the river and the lakes. There are more than 200 methods proposed and they are used in 44 different countries, but there is no universally acceptable method for environmental flow release. The most common one and one widely used uh, method is tenant method, which is, was also recommended for Iran, uh, but um, uh, based on uh, um, the research that we conducted, the, this tenant method is uh, the least, least efficient method that can be applied in such condition. So our conditions are arid region with intensive irrigation. And how do you think uh, why uniform release of uh, environmental flow during the year is not efficient in our conditions? So now that's a question for your students. Why do you think just releasing like around 10% of uh, the flow during the year is not efficient in the condition of arid and intensive irrigation region? Anyone, guys? I see a mixed uh, a mixture here of students from research methods, but anyway, and water. <laughs> I think it's a question more for water. For the water guys. Yeah, water guys. Yes. Yeah, I don't want to pick specific people. So if there is no... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Stefanos, you would like to guess why? <laughs> I want the one off. I think one off is gonna be probably higher evaporation or um, not gonna be good for environmental flows. But I, I would say regularity, I think I would be more beneficial than one off case. But I'm not a hydrologist. Yeah, but, uh, I think uh, Norin wants to answer it as well. Yes, thank you, Aziza. Uh, it's a good question. So I think that uh, low population and uh, big territory of Kazakhstan and it's not uh, how to say uh, uh, it's not big revenue or uh, income from this in case of Kazakhstan it's a lot of dumps and uh, is a big territory how to manage it and uh, uh, I think you mean that environment flow in Kazakhstan yes why we didn't uh, realize this in Kazakhstan. So uh, one of the problems that uh, we have a, a low po uh, population. Okay, so, uh, uh, thank you. It's, it's a nice guess. Uh, we um, applied this methodology on uh, Iran. So it's not about Kazakhstan, but I believe that it can be useful in Kazakhstan conditions as well, as we also have arid climate with intensive irrigation. So let's see um, why uh, we should consider the timing also, not just the magnitude of environmental flow. And uh, this study employed a new methodology that was designed uh, to make an optimum monthly environmental flow release strategy for reservoirs. They considered farmers' water use, that was uh, one of the main uh, answers that I was waiting for. So um, in these uh, conditions, most of the water is used by farmers. That's why it's not reaching uh, the lake. So releasing it during the year is not efficient because even if we release it uh, in several uh, months during the year, the water will be used by farmers and it anyway won't reach the lake. So it's not efficient. But it also included uh, the return flow from irrigation, interaction with groundwater, and uh, evaporation and natural flow regime. So uh, this new methodology is kind of holistic and it includes all these years of studies conducted by Professor Turaviov and uh, Professor Klov on uh, environmental flow regime and sensitivity of lake to flow regime change and lake hydrogeography. Uh, the geography, you will see the references later on in the presentation. 
So um, as you can see in natural conditions, um, the flow rate at the downstream station is a function of upstream station. So basically in the downstream, we will get all the flow from the river and uh, that should increase uh, along the river as uh, the, the catchment is increasing. And uh, in the uh, highly irrigated conditions, uh, the, um, the flow downstream is uh, water consumption, as in the lower part, uh, the, we will get less water because along the river, farmers used up all the uh, water, so they uptake water from the river. So basically, uh, the flow uh, can, um, downstream is a, a difference between upstream and water consumption amount, uh, also including the loss for, uh, through consumption, evaporation, and groundwater seepage. So uh, we used these um, assumptions and uh, regression analysis uh, to do to design a scenarios for environmental flow release. And you can see uh, in these two graphs for two lakes cases that um, in natural season, uh, the best linear regression is uh, uh, with the first equation. Uh, and uh, in the highly intensive irrigation um, conditions, the the regression coefficient is uh, best for the second equation. And you can see that for the winter months, uh, for like February and March, we can see R square uh, value high for the first equation. And for the summer months uh, or months during the vegetation period, we have higher uh, value of R square for the second equation. So, uh, by applying this um, regression analysis, we found the best uh, uh, scenarios for the Lake Bachtegan, for the second largest lake in Iran. And uh, we found out that uh, the tenant method is uh, ranked as a 52nd out of 88 um, scenarios. And uh, as you can see, the most effective one, that 100% uh, efficiency, is releasing the water during one month. It's uh, during the winter months, February. And overall, uh, the discharge during the winter months, during the wet period, um, most efficient one. For the second case, for the Lake Urmia case, uh, again, uh, we had several uh, scenarios and we ran 372 water balance simulations. And as you can see, again, uh, the monthly release is the most uh, efficient one and uh, the uh, annual release as a tenant method which is 10 percent release during the year or the annual release uniform uh, release is a less least efficient one uh, so to find the best uh, environmental flow release strategies for lake Urmia, we calculated the equilibrium water level uh, and uh, also we estimated the minimum ecological level. So you can see that, um, uh, again, this L, the release during one month during May, is the most efficient one. And uh, we can see that by uh, releasing uh, around 2.4 cubic kilometers during one month, we can uh, ensure this minim minimum ecological water level in the Lake Burmi. Uh, with uh, this uh, tenant method that was um, proposed for the annual release, we won't reach the minimum ecological water level at all. Uh, and uh, for example, to reach the, the same level uh, for equilibrium water level, we need uh, around 1.6 cubic kilometers uh, released during May. And uh, to reach the same point uh, using the tenant method, we need a higher amount of water to be released, so almost twice amount. So you can see how uh, applying different methods, but applying of these methods requires uh, the change in uh, reservoir operation, which is also a management and policy question. 
So this bridging the gap between scientists and the managers is really important because um, it's uh, also can be used as a um, uh, like a source of dialogue for the um, for the foreign affairs for the um, dialogue between the transboundary like in, in the transboundary issues as well. Uh, and uh, I, I think you now uh, students also can guess which lake in Kazakhstan can follow the RLC case. Guys, do you know the name of the lake? Balhash. Yes, yes, I think we're all aware of the Balhash case. So, um, and, and you also know that we can't reach uh, the point of cooperation between China and Kazakhstan. Uh, and maybe such um, environment, like environmental flow regime, can also be one of the can can solve those such issues. So that's uh, that's all. Thank you, guys. I think I don't know if you have any questions. I, I will be happy to answer it. At some point, uh, Aziza and uh, Bjorn, uh, Bjorn, I don't see Bjorn anymore here. Ali, I see here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, guys, I mean, practically, you say just to change a bit the, the irrigation pattern, right? Because when you release the water in February or you, when you release the water in May, the main question is whether the guys in the farmers, they want the water at the time that you propose to them. Yes. And the question is whether the, crop, the crops that they use, they need the water at this time, right? So it's yeah. not like releasing water one off, but releasing the whole the whole agricultural scheme there, yeah. You know, you know exactly. We 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 said we allocated, for example, 100 MCM for the environmental flow. We recommend it really is in the winter time that the farmer not interested to use this water. If yeah. we release it uniform, for example, during August, no water goes to the lake because the farmer use that water. They use all water in the river. So we, we, it's just a recommendation for the releasing water in correct time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, it has to be like also with the cropping, what kind of crops, how, how frequently do they use, where they use, because they may need some water sometimes, you know, but mm -hmm. it, it is not. So, but of course that's super novel and innovative and it's really good. I'm just saying that it needs quite a consensus and stakeholders acceptance, all these things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There is a lot of things we should do behind yeah, yeah, this yeah, yeah. to, sure, to sure, be yeah, a, yeah. to be a, a, in application and it could be applicable in general. Yeah. yeah. But one of the recommendation also was that uh, during the paper, if you go to through the paper that we recommend uh, when we have a high rainfall, it is the good time to release yeah. also environmental flow. Then for sure, the agriculture, there is no water consumption for irrigation because actually the soil is moist and they don't need water and the water can easily goes to the lake. If, we, if a target is lake, but sometimes the target for environmental flow is river, then this, yeah. prescri this prescription not work for the river. And yeah, it is because just if you for leave the... the whole water there, it's going to be a <laughs> yeah. mess down there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it is just prescription for the lake and uh, saving the lake at yeah. the ter terminal, ter terminal lake. Terminal lake, so, yeah. So Aziza, thank you very much. It was very interesting presentation. I like it. So if you stop sharing, maybe we can have some conclusion at the end, uh, Stefanos, if you agree, if you have time about sure, one, I mean, two, three. Uh, yeah, we're out of time anyways, but uh, you can conclude. <laughs> <laughs> just, just uh, Aziza, if you stop sharing, just we, I can uh, summarize what we did today. Just let's, I back to my first slide that we have here. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for all presenter. We uh, look at different issue from the modern country like Singapore. What's the main issue? It's the urban flood, and what's happened in the other country. We have a uh, we, we see what's happened in upstream and what's happening downstream. We saw Turkey case and uh, developing the dams in Turkey and what's happening in Iran route in the south. Then again, same condition we have in border of Afghanistan and Iran. Then, then there is was dam construction again problem for the lake. Then we look at that it problem was for transboundary many years ago, but nowadays 
the issue goes inside of the country. When we have a case inside of the Iran Lake, Urumia Lake, uh, Bakhtegan Lake, and also Zayan Road that needs are present, that now the scale of the problem change. We down scale problem from transboundary to regional. And it is one another issue that coming up uh, for future more. Then we talk about uh, Caspian Sea as a common area between five, six country around that. And uh, it, it is, there is, might be, there is not big problem for the drying the lake or something, but we should think about future of this uh, big uh, water resources also, and to think about those wetlands around that because they are more vulnerable area around the, this uh, big sea or biggest the water body in the world. And finally, we give some solution like, environmental flow and how we can really, but, but we focus on the irrigation, uh, we focus on irrigation and see how the efficient environmental release can help to uh, save the lake and we have more water inside of the lake during winter time. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any concern, question, comment, advice, please, we are listening. All right. Uh... Great, thanks, and uh, also uh, great thanks for your team, because we have to mention to the students, that's a team from uh, Ulu University, and also Professor Dr. Tagada from Glasgow that drives us to, to Singapore. And Singapore probably, as you said, is like an example, somewhere an island uh, that is super developed, but mm -hmm. you, we see that they also have problems in their own region with their different context, yeah? yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's a kind of universal situation. So, promise to continue cooperation. Great, thanks also for having uh, the class uh, here. Thank you, fellows, uh, for attending the course. The, not the course, <laughs> the, <laughs> the session. Yeah, and uh, we'll uh, keep in touch to, to continue cooperation in many other outlets. Sure. I, I, I would like to have uh, some summarize from Cecilia, if she, she wants to say something at the end. She, she, She's, we, we, it is important for us to know her feedback also. Please, Cecilia, if you have some word to us. Thank you very much. I enjoy the presentations very much. And I think it was very clear that all these environmental problems we have, they are, well, yes, they are because of climate change, but the other part is the human part. And like Stefan has mentioned, many times actions are not taken because the because climate change is blamed us very conveniently. So it's, it's better not to take decisions. I mean, we continue, we as countries continue taking our unilateral decisions and we blame it to climate change. Yep. And the, the example of the different lakes is just an example of, of poor development related decision making. At the end, it has nothing to do with the environment, it's just that is just the impact, but is is the decision making the one that needs to be improved, either within the countries or in terms of, of collaboration of different countries. Thank you again for the invitation. And thank you very much, you. Okay, Stefanos, you can say final word then. If... No, I'm fine, man. we don't know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th thank you very much. Okay, if, if you have any question or concern, you can send us email and our teams at Mahdi, Sahan, Aziza, and Niza can reply you quickly. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. You have a nice weekend. Bye. Thank you, and you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.